Well, Kathy was very, very polite to accept once again our invitation and, and continue our talk on writing. So please, Kathy, go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for having me to your meeting. Um, I'm, I, I, I was delighted that I would be able to finally come to Athens, um, but uh, it looks like uh, events have again overtaken us. Um, so I'm gonna be talking uh, about writing today. Um, and I think that, um, you know, as, as has been said, that writing doesn't occupy um, a very prominent place in, in the study of language. But what I hope to show you is that writing is kind of its own thing and deserves to be an object of study. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hopefully, um, hopefully you can see that. Um, so one of the key questions, or one of the most important questions in the theory of language uh, has to do with understanding variation in language structure. Um, why does this variation arise? What are the mechanisms that underpin language change? And I think that in the last 10 years, there's really been increasing interest in this. And there's even a, a conference devoted to this topic, and it's called Evolang. Now, theories of language evolution invoke constraints such as cognitive ease, communicative need, and efficiency. And if you were here at the meeting last year, you may have remembered that Jonathan Harrington gave a very interesting keynote lecture about these questions with regard to sound change. Now, over the past few years, my group has been pondering similar themes about written language. Now, written language is obviously very different to spoken language. Uh, most obviously, it's a recent invention, 5,000 years old at most, and writing systems are still being invented today. Likewise, the standardization of writing through dictionaries means that it doesn't change very rapidly. Yet, I think think that we can still ask the question of what makes a writing system optimal. And we can ask whether there's any evidence that writing changes in response to those constraints, knowing that those constraints may well be different than for spoken language. All right, so let's begin with writing systems. And writing allows us to access language through the visual modality. But precisely how we do that depends on the nature of the writing system. Now, writing systems are all uh, expressions of spoken language. They represent spoken language, but they vary considerably, not only in the way that they map to spoken language, but in, in their age and the extent to which they progress. A sample of writing systems here, we can see here up in the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but up in the uh, left-hand corner, we've got Korean, which is thought to be one of the, the most scientifically perfect writing systems. This offers a one-to-one -one relationship between symbols and sounds. Um, and the shapes of the symbols themselves um, mimic the position of the articulatory organs needed to produce them. And that was very deliberate when the system was created about 600 years ago. Um, we've got um, other writing systems, we've got um, uh, Chinese here on the um, bottom right, Chinese is very different. So Chinese is basically an exercise in learning individual characters. There's some capacity for generalization, but Chinese takes a long time to learn to read because of this uh, degree of rote me memorization. Right above this, we've got um, Chinese with pinyin um, written above it. So pinyin is an alphabetic system that was designed to help people to learn to read. So it's a transcription of the Chinese language in a sort of Romanized alphabet. What else have we got? We've got um, Hebrew, which in, in its um, sort of adult form doesn't represent vowels. We've got shorthand, which was deliberately created to prioritize 
speed and efficiency, that's here in the middle. We've got braille, which is a tactile writing system. So the braille cell can represent letters or chunks of letters or even whole words. And of course, we've got um, the Roman alphabet here, which is used to transcribe many languages. Now, I think um, certainly there's been substantial interest in the way that these writing sh systems shape how the brain learns to read. And I think it's, it's well accepted that the brain um, does not learn to read in the same way in Chinese as it does in, in Korean or something like, like Serbian, which is a very transparent alphabetic system. But however, we've rarely asked why this variation arises in the or whether these systems are equally optimal. And I think that there's at least an implicit assumption that some of these systems are more optimal than others, at least for some types of tasks. So I've already talked about the fact that Korean and Pinyin were invented to try to promote literacy, to make it easier to learn to read. And I've talked about how shorthand was invented to prioritize speed and efficiency. So these are cases where a new writing system has been introduced for a particular purpose. But we might also ask whether spelling change uh, happens more gradually as a result of particular pressures. So it may be that certain writing systems are more optimal than others. And it's an interesting question to ask how they got that way. So to consider these questions, we need to first go back and think about what writing is. So the Wikipedia definition of writing is simply that it's a representation of spoken language, rendering spoken language into a form that can be reconstructed by other humans separated in space and time. So writing is always defined with respect to spoken language. It's a representation of its spoken language, right? But writing isn't the same thing as spoken language. And it's important to think about how it differs. So here we've got some examples of writing. So one thing we know about writing is that writing uses much richer vocabulary and much more complex syntax than spoken language. So when we write something down, we're not just transcribing the spoken language, we're actually communicating something very different. We're packing material into the text. And you can see that here in uh, the upper right, upper left with David Copperfield, right? So nobody speaks like this, right? This is a fact about writing. So writing is in a sense richer than spoken language, but it's also more impoverished. So writing lacks those very important cues such as prosody, gesture, audiovisual information, background or environmental context. So in some sense, writing is delivering more information, but is also more impoverished. And I think we can ask a question whether there is any pressure on writing to depart from spoken language, offer additional information that would support rapid access to language through vision. So that's what writing does. It enables us to access write, uh, language through vision, or as Mark Seidenberg says, language at the speed of sight. So does, does writing depart from spoken language in a way that, that is functionally important, that makes sense? And we can see already some of the ways that writing departs from spoken language. So we see the use of spacing between words. We don't have any uh, spaces between words in spoken language. We can see here the Emily Dickinson poem, how line breaks and <coughs> are used to convey an emotional experience or to generate an emotional experience. Up in the top right, we've got German and we see the use of capital letters to denote noun status, right? So immediately looking at the text, you know what is a noun, right? So that information is not available in spoken language. And I think that spacing provides a very good example um, of, this, uh, of these issues. And I think one of the first delineations of, of this thesis was really by Paul Sanger um, over 20 years ago now. So what he wrote about was the fact that spacing is kind of an interesting convention in, in writing because it breaks the link between spoken and written language. If we wanted to transcribe spoken language faithfully, we would not use spaces between words, right? But we know that spacing supports 
skilled reading. So if you remove the spaces in the English text, people slow down, people slow down. That's not surprising. But if you take a language that's transcribed using unspaced text and you in, insert spaces in it, reading becomes quicker, right? So that actually facilitates reading. So spacing helps us to read, but it breaks the link between spoken and written language. And what Sanger uh, postulated was that the emergence of spacing between words co-occurred with the development of silent reading. And what, what Sanger pondered was whether these things were causally related. So is it possible that spacing emerged in some way to depart from reading as, a, as an oral pastime to the skilled silent reading that we know today? And if it was a causal relationship, the development of spacing, then what was the mechanism of that change? I don't know the answer to that, and, and neither did um, Paul Sanger, but I think it's an interesting question. And indeed, I think it leads to this more general perspective that we see over and over in the history of, of theory of writing. So there's one uh, nice quote that's used frequently. Every language gets the writing system it deserves. So somehow here, there's a, a sense that there are certain writing systems that may, may be more optimal than others, and that they're suited in particular to the spoken language. And there's also a sense that the writing gets there in some way, right? It eventually gets the writing system it deserves, but it's left open about how that occurs. And I've just got some quotes here from, from some leading researchers in the area of reading and writing. So we've got David Scher saying, every writing system is a living, breathing organism that must adapt to the ever-changing needs of its users, their culture, and the technology of communication. It's living and breathing. It, it adapts. We've got Ram Frost. Writing systems evolve to provide optimal information by weighting the need for maximum cues about spoken words and their specific meanings while using minimal orthographic load. So here we have the sense that first of all, writing systems are optimal. They evolve to get that way. And, and the argument is one of communicative efficiency. So packing in the most information for the minimal orthographic load. And finally, we've got Mark Seidenberg, who actually puts forward a specific hypothesis the writing systems that have survived support comprehension about equally well. Reading comprehension is a constant that is maintained via trade-offs between orthographic complexity and spoken language complexity. So if we look across the piece at all the writing systems, what you get are very transparent writing systems when you have difficult spoken languages with difficult typically being represented by inflectional case. And if you don't have a very difficult spoken language, then that you can tolerate a more complex uh, writing system, right? So these are all cases in which people have argued that writing systems evolve and they evolve to some kind of optimal state where, where optimality is defined by some form of psychological pressure, right? Now, I, I really like this hypothesis, but it's, it's um, painfully easy to refute. And one of the best examples I think of how to refute this is to look at Braille. So Braille is an invented writing system. It's very recent. It's highly regulated. So we have two forms of Braille. One is uncontracted Braille. So this is just the Braille cell is the same as a letter. So you, you write out all the letters using the, the six raised dots of the Braille cell. Now in contracted Braille, and contracted Braille is what is the primary form that's used in most contexts. So it's the legal requirement to use this in public signage in the USA, for example, under the Americans for Disabilities Act. Contracted Braille um, doesn't write out every letter. It has contractions that, that either express chunks of letters, very frequent chunks, or even whole words. And those contractions are fully standardized in a rule book for unified English Braille. And that rule book is decided on by experts every few years. And the stated intuitive reasons for the use of contractions in Braille are that it makes production easier and for cognitive ease. So it's thought that it makes the writing system more optimal for these reasons. It's easier to produce and it's cognitively easier. 
Well, it, it turns out that um, it, it's not that easy after all, because when you contract letters, what you get is a disruption of morpheme boundaries. So here we have some examples. So when I've got uh, letters in capital, that means it's actually one, it's one letter, it's one symbol. So we've got redirect, but we've obscured the morpheme boundary with the ED contraction. The same is true in boredom, right? We've obscured the morpheme boundary. Mistrust, ST is its own contraction. So that's a single letter. And of course, again, we've, we've obscured the, uh, the morphine boundary. And the same is, is true for rerun, obscure the morphine boundary. And as you can probably guess, when people eventually studied the impact of this on the recognition of braille words, they found that there was an enormous recognition penalty of these contractions. So our intuitions about what makes a writing system optimal aren't necessarily correct. Right, so how have we normally thought about alphabetic writing systems? We've normally thought about them in terms of something called orthographic depth. So orthographic depth is the extent to which an alphabetic writing system faithfully represents the sounds of a language. So we've got on the left-hand side, very shallow orthographies. So Serbian is a good example. Here we've got one symbol for one sound and there are no exceptions, okay? Of course, Serbian has a, a funny property that it's bialphabetic, but within each alphabet, it is fully transparent. English is the prototypical example of a deep orthography. So English, we've got one symbol mapping to many sounds. We've got many symbols mapping to the same, sorry, many symbols mapping to the same sound. In, in both directions, there's many exceptions. It's highly opaque, it's a deep orthography. And you know, most uh, writing systems, alphabetic orthographies fall somewhere in the middle of that. And there's been a huge industry in looking at the impact of orthographic depth on recognition and learning to read. So we've got, here's a couple studies. So we've got a, a study by Seymour and colleagues looking at reading accuracy across a number of European writing systems by the end of the first grade. And we see that writing systems that are more transparent, uh, Austrian, German, et cetera, compared to English, I mean, English at the end of the first year is very low accuracy. It's very, very difficult to learn to read in English. Um, and that was ascribed to the the orthographic depth of these different writing systems. On the right, we've got a very nice study by Spencer and Hanley looking at English and Welsh, learning to read in English and Welsh. Now, English is very deep. Welsh um, is a very shallow orthography. And it turns out you can go to an English school or a Welsh school in Wales. And they did a very nice study where they measured reading accuracy in, at three points in the first year of reading instruction. And what you can see is that it's very, it's very simple to learn to read aloud in Welsh and it's very difficult to do so in English. And these kinds of studies have suggested that there's something that's not quite right with English. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be very optimal, right? And that's, oh, this is where my slides are packing up. There we go. Um, and that's led to calls and these calls have, have been going on for 500 years that there's something about English that needs to be reformed, okay? So this was an article that appeared in the Times a few months ago, where once again, uh, some group is proposing that we should change the English writing system to make it more optimal. So you can see the highlighted bits. They want to accelerate access to literacy. They're calling English broken, crazy, it's been chopped and changed by invaders, printers, and scribes. Um, talking about the number of children who leave school with low literacy. And the, the idea here of these people is that we should have a more transparent writing system. And indeed, if we go back 50 years in England, we actually get to something called the initial teaching alphabet, which used to be taught. This was a, a system with 43 symbols as opposed to 26. It tried to more faithfully represent um, English sounds. And you can see this is one of the Ladybird books um, with, with its you know, funny characters that it was using. Now, of course, that's been abandoned. It turned out that it, it didn't work very well. But there's a sense here that people think that something is, is not quite right with English. It's not optimal. 
right? So there's a sense that there is something that's optimal and English is not. So let's think about this. Would reform optimize English spelling? Well, we don't really know, right? Because we don't really know why spelling sound inconsistency exists um, or what the consequence would be of getting rid of it. And I've got um, Anna Ulicheva here who's uh, working in my lab and who has been leading um, all of our work in this domain. And what we've proposed is that there's some sort of trade-off between spelling sound inconsistency in a writing system and spelling meaning information. So if you simplify a writing system, but that might lead to a loss of meaningful information and thereby hinder comprehension. So if you take a spoken language, if you directly just transcribe it, then any ambiguities that are there in the spoken language will just be transmitted to the written language. So if you try to get a more faithful representation, then you risk losing that information. And it's really easy to see if you consider something like homophones, that we've got in English two different words for the words pear and pear, the fruit and the, and the group. And we can see here on the right that if we gave just one um, spelling, that would make the spelling system more consistent, right? We wouldn't have so many spellings for a single sound, but it would make it harder to derive the meaning of that word, right? So we're gonna sacrifice something if we reform the spelling. So we've tackled this in two ways. The first way has been to look at meaningful morphemic information in um, written language. So in English, we have found over the last few years that letter clusters in English become reserved for communicating meaning. So here we have ED. ED is indicative of past tense. And just look here at what this means. We've got ED over and over and over again, but actually we have a very poor representation between spelling and sound, all right? Because here it's hooked, planned, and needed, right? So we're using the same spelling to index three sounds. Um, over here, it's kind of the opposite situation. So we've got many ways to spell us, but it turns out that O-U-S is reserved for communicating adjective status, right? And if we had only one spelling, then that, that would be lost, okay? And interestingly, this information is not available in spoken language. It's only available in the written language. If we had a more transparent spelling system, so here we, here we have some possible spellings, hooked, planned, and needed, curious atlas and citrus, that would make it easier perhaps to learn, but the meaningful information would be lost. And what we've asked is whether English might actually occupy some kind of sweet spot between learnability and comprehension. And this is just a, a simple slide. I, I don't want you to look too hard at this. This is just every about 130 suffixes in English. And all it shows is that you've got these suffixes up at the very top, that simply shows that they're highly diagnostic of a particular grammatical category, right? So meaningful information is highly visible in English spelling. And that is at the cost of spelling sound transparency, right? You can't get suffixes that stand for particular meanings if you're always just representing sounds faithfully, right? So that's what happens. And this is just a very simple um, study showing that, that skilled readers are highly sensitive to these forms of regularity. So this was an easy study where we just had people decide whether certain, um, certain non-words were adjectives or nouns. And it turns out that those adjectives, the, those non-words with suffixes that were associated strongly with adjective status, people were more likely to say that they're adjectives. And that effect was graded. So the stronger a, su a, a suffix indicates adjective status, the more likely are people to ascribe it to be an adjective. So people are sensitive to this information that's in the writing system. And indeed, what this means is that immediately when seeing an English word, someone can decide whether it's an object, um, a property, or an act. Right? So that information is not in the spoken language. And these types of effects are observed in spelling and also in eye tracking of natural reading. 
So the other uh, approach that we've taken to this is to try to calculate lexical density of spoken and written spellings to the, of the lexica. So the way that we've done this is to look at Liebenstein distance between uh, a spoken or a written word and all of its, its neighbors or all other written words or spoken words in the language. And Liebenstein distance is just a metric where we count the number of edits that are required to change one word into another. So here we have an example of um, pair, the spoken words pair and pair. Those are identical. So that's a Liebenstein distance of zero. Um, whereas here we've got the spellings pair and pair. Those are not identical. Um, and they've got a Liebenstein distance of two. So here we have that these are less, uh, there's, there's, they're more sparse, right? It's less dense. The spoken language in this case is more dense. So we've done this for all monosyllables in English. And so what we've done, we've taken the spoken language and we've taken the written language, just monosyllables. So we're not dealing with morphology uh, to, to a great extent. And we've simply compared every word to every other word, right? And what we do then is we get um, a Liebenstein distance for every single pair and then we just plot those in a frequency distribution. And so the idea is that the closer the neighbors, right, the closer a word is to everything else in the lexicon, the denser that lexicon is. And we might think that we want a sparse lexicon for, for greater disambiguation. So if a word looks very similar to everything else, it's hard to disambiguate. If it looks very different, then it's much easier to disambiguate. And this is what we find. So. What this is, we've got the written lexicon here on the top, and we've got the spoken lexicon here on the bottom. And the warm colors indicate um, larger Liebenstein distances. So this is a sparser lexicon. So what we have is that the written lexicon of monosyllables is substantially sparser. The words are further apart in the written lexicon than in the spoken lexicon. And you can see that because the written, written lexicon here has warmer colors indicating a sparser lexicon. And note here that English has many fewer letters than it has phonemes. So there's a, a pre-existing bias for the written language to be denser than the spoken language. But, but not only do we overcome the bias, it actually goes in the other direction, right? So written language pulls words apart from each other in English compared to the spoken language. Now, let me plot this a different way. So here we have every monosyllable in English is one data point, and we've calculated the phonological Liebenstein distance for its phonological form on the x-axis and the orthographic Liebenstein distance for each word, word on the, on the y-axis. And the greater the Liebenstein distance, remember, the sparser the lexicon. So if English were a perfect transcription of the spoken language, it would be on the diagonal, right? But what we find, as we've just shown in the last graph, is that the English spelling system is sparser than the, than the spoken uh, lexicon. And that sparseness is particularly concentrated in areas where phonological density is high. Right? So written language pulls apart phonologically similar words. So it infect, it disambiguates them. Now, what would happen if we reform the spelling? Well, this is easy to figure out. What we can do is simply take the different uh, spelling, sound spelling combinations and reform them so that there's only one spelling for certain sounds. So here we have an example, right? So we, we've got the J is gonna be spelled J, right? So we've got jam. Now, if we prune the next correspondence, so we're gonna get rid of D, G, E, right? And just use J. So we'll have lodge. This is like somewhere where you go to stay, a lodge. And here we have, we're gonna take away G, E as a correspondence and we've got binge. So you might go binge drinking. And so these are the types of spellings that are used in the initial teaching alphabet or the types of spellings that are being used, thought of as a good reform to English. 
So we progressively prune more and more of these correspondences and we measure the impact on lexicon density. And this is what we find. All right, so here we've got the same plot as before, but the only thing, and it's completely obvious, is that the disambiguation of spelling gets lesser as we make the writing system simpler, right? So as we simplify the writing system, make it closer to the sound, we lose a bit of disambiguation, right? Simpler spelling, less dis disambiguation. And we think that that might have consequences for reading. So what we've got here is what seems to be a trade-off between learnability on the one hand and comprehension. So learning is easiest when the spellings are a faithful representation of the sounds, but perhaps that's not gonna make comprehension very easy. We comprehend when we're able to disambiguate rapidly. And I think that that fits really well with existing conceptions of, of theoretical models of how we read, right? So we learn to read by mapping spellings to sounds and then onto meanings, but eventually, we've got to develop a direct mapping between spellings and meanings. And that's this ventral pathway here. That takes a very, very long time to develop. And perhaps it's that mapping that really benefits from um, a high degree of, of meaningful information, such as morphological information or disambiguating information um, in the writing system. So the question is, does that optimal system occupy a sweet spot between learnability and comprehension. Now I looked back at my abstract and I said that the second part of my talk was gonna talk about diachronic evidence about how English got there or how languages get there. Um, and I haven't made as much progress on this as I, as I thought I, I might have. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some recent work by Christian Berg and Mark Aronoff. So what they did was that four sentences and they, charted them back about 800 years. And they tried to see what's the usage of these different orthographic suffixes. And so this is an example of the suffix O-U-S. And what you can see if you go back to 1250, which is on this side, is that the spelling or the sound sequence us, if it's an adjective, there's lots of different ways to spell this, right? It was very non-standardized, but over time, O-U-S to describe an adjective to kind of now it's 100%, right? So it's perfectly standardized. So there's some anecdotal evidence here that, that the spelling is changing in a direction that, that increases the specificity of English spelling. But of course, they just looked at four suffixes and much more systematic research I think is needed to infer that there's been some kind of meaningful diachronic change that's relevant to a theory based on psychological pressures or cognitive ease. And I think that, you know, if we talk about, it's easy to say that writing systems evolved, but if we want to talk about the evolution of a writing system, that requires us to have some specification of the mechanism, right? And if we um, look at theories of cultural evolution, we talk about things like variation. Where does, where does the variation come from? What is the variation? What is the selection pressure that's being applied consistently? How is the result of that selection pressure propagated? These are all questions that a theory of spelling evolution would need to answer. And so when we see claims such as that, you know, English spelling has self-organized or that writing systems are living and breathing, those are hand-waving, um, I think, without a mechanism. So there's a, a great deal of work to do here to find out, to understand how spellings um, came to be. So what have I said? The first thing I've, I've said is that writing is not the same thing as spoken language. It communicates different information. It deserves to be studied as its own thing. Um, and there's every reason to think that the constraints on writing would be different than the constraints on spoken language. So what's going to make a writing system optimal differs from what makes a language optimal. And our intuitions about what makes a writing system optimal may well be wrong. And I think the Braille example uh, pr provides a very good example of that. In terms of alphabetic systems, the field is focused on learnability and typically the extent to which a writing system represents the sounds of spoken language faithfully. But I think we've shown that comprehension also matters 
And there's reasonable evidence that English spelling trades learnability for disambiguation, either through morphology or some other means. Of course, I've only looked at English and it's an interesting question to ask, well, is that trade-off expressed in other languages? And people often ask me, I mean, what does that mean about a system like Korean, which does offer a perfect rendition of the spoken form? Does that mean that that writing system is actually less optimal for skilled silent reading? And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and I think there's a substantial need in this, in this field for more precise theorizing about diachronic change and its underpinning mechanisms, if indeed this change has been functional. So um, again, to thank my lab and especially Anna Ulacheva, um, and thank you very much. I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Um, thanks, Kathy. So I'm. If anyone has any questions, I'm. Uh, my name is Alexis, and I'm coordinating the meeting. And let's just look at who has their hands raised, and we can go asking the questions. Okay. Um, uh, Ione, I, Ioannis, do you want to start? Does anyone have any questions? Well, uh, if I may start, I have a lot of questions and I waited for somebody else to... But until somebody else wishes to put a question, I might ask you, Kathy, a few things. I will start with the most phonetic one about the spaces. That's very clever. We use spaces. Remember, the early Greeks did not use spaces. But we hear and interpret not only phonologically, but meaningfully. That's why we separate. I mean, words, they have some independent status and it's good to separate. We don't hear and we don't communicate phonetically in a sound way. So it's something good. Then I would say, a few things about the ED, yes, in English, this end shows past tense. And it has a lot, okay, you have some exceptions, some irregular verbs, but apart from this, it is non-variable. ED is equal to past tense. On the other hand, you have a normus uh, spoken or sound variability. But the case here is that either way, it doesn't pose any problem. I mean to say, we don't interpret language uh, window-wise or word-wise. We wait a lot before we make our we make up our minds what we have heard we don't interpret speech and language word wise so even the other pairs uh, you mentioned here the peer or pair if they are homophonous i don't know uh, even in spoken either in spoken language or in written sp language, we do not interpret word by word. We are waiting a lot because as I was saying, we were talking about those things with Todd Gibson the other day. Uh, if you ask me today, most of the time we guess what we have heard. We don't hear, it's not in the, we guess, 
and we take the best guess. It's like as if we were, we were computers. Uh, if you take any language, we live, we don't pronounce in casual speech, even syllables. But syllables, the word itself, it's back here in our head. So if we get enough cues from the context, we interpret because we know the language. Yeah, I think I think some of those points are really interesting. I mean, the the issue about spacing. One one thing that really struck me in in Sanger's book was was this notion that prior to the introduction of spacing, that you know the point of reading and the point of writing something down was, was to be able to to transmit it orally, right? So so people didn't sit there reading silently. They'd write it down and they would you know, you'd have orators that 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 read things aloud. And what he talks about was that prior to the introduction of spacing, you know, even the concept of a word didn't really figure, right? So a word is something that you get when you have spaced, you know, spacing between words, right? That's what delineates a word. If you don't have any kind of experience of, of spaced text, if you just have spoken language, well, then, you know, what is a word? Um, so I think that your, your observation about, about Greek is, is quite interesting. The other thing is I, I totally agree with you that, I mean, if we think about reading, I mean, we read at 250 words a minute, right? That is fast. It's far faster than we, than we communicate using spoken language. And the question is, how do we do this? This is a system that is, is not, we're not born to do, we're not born to read, right? This is a system that has to be learned it has to hijack or recycle existing neural hardware. Um, so it's something that's just cultural and yet we do it so, so well. And I think that you're right. I think we use multiple cues and I think prediction is, I mean, there's a big de debate about prediction but we've got some data. I could have, could have given another talk about, about prediction and the way that you know, this is you know, really fundamental in, in reading. And I think probably I'm coming more to the view that when we read, what we are actually doing is just sort of looking for, for deviation when, when something's not predicted. So I think that there's multiple cues that, that assist us, but we still have to learn, right? We still have to, have to get through. I mean, ideally you'd have, you'd have a system that's you know, highly you know, prioritizes disambiguation, meaningful information, but if you can't learn it, then you're not gonna get anywhere, right? So I think you know, typically we've in this field, we focused on the learnability. Um, and I think that that's because the people that are interested in, in you know, children's reading are looking at children who are a very early stage of their reading. They haven't tended to focus on what happens when you become a skilled reader, which is when you're really learning to read very, very rapidly for meaning. So I think probably both of these things, learnability and comprehension um, enter into this um, equation. Um, I'm not sure about production, Quite, quite possibly um, there is a, a production constraint as well, but we haven't looked at this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, uh, Kathy, someone's made some comments in the chat. They've um, asked you a question, said it would be interesting to see how your results replicate, don't replicate in the writing systems like Chinese. William posed you the question, Kathy. Oh yeah, terrific question. And I think whenever I talk about English, I always feel you know, really, you know, kind of lame because I'm just talking about English. Um, I think English is really interesting because it, it is one of these systems that has not been really regulated, right? It's resisted reform. So Mark Aronoff talks about it as being self-organizing, which I think, you know, it, it is interesting, but absolutely. I think, you know, if there are psychological pressures to a certain extent on which writing systems survive or how they adapt or however that, that is achieved, that has to be a theory that works not only for English, but also for Chinese and Korean, um, et cetera. So we should find um, cases that allow us to either you know, falsify um, these ideas or to take them further. There's another one I see that's, that's really a really neat observation about how poets and literary artists are using spelling or wording for means of aesthetic, including calligraphy. I think that there's also an expressive dimension to writing which should not be underestimated. Absolutely. I think, um, again, these are things that are not in spoken language um, and, and really haven't been studied very much. That's a great comment. Thanks very much.
Well, thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. We're going on to paper one, and we're delighted to introduce Kate Tallon, who's uh, going to be talking. One minute, mm -hmm. one, one minute, please. Uh, well, uh, on behalf of uh, the Exling Society, I would like to thank Kathy again. Thank you. Well, the more I listen to you, the more I enjoy the, the, the talk. <laughs> Uh, we must have you more and more in our society, Kathy. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye.